pleasure to welcome you all to the OU Israel Center. Uh, as you can see, I'm not actually not so surprised by the turnouts. Those of us that have ever had the great fortune of meeting Mrs. Rita Quint, knowing what an outstanding human being she is, and then if you've ever had the good fortune to hear her incredibly inspiring story, um, I'm not at all surprised that we have the standing room only crowd this evening. Um, my relationship with Rena actually goes back, we're going to do our best, we're working on it. My relationship with Rena actually goes back about eight years when I was teaching in a, a post high school yeshiva program. And for a number of years, Rena would come and tell, share her story with the boys, and the boys would be completely on the edge of their seats and completely inspired by her as well. And about a year and a half ago, when I joined the staff here at the OU Israel Center, thank God we've had the great pleasure to see Rena on a regular basis, because this is one of her homes away from home. And um, it's a tremendous, tremendous scoot for us to welcome both Barbara Sofer and Rena Quinn to share this incredible story with us, both the story of Rena's life in and of itself and the story of the, the journey to producing this book and publishing her story to share with the world. So I thank you all for joining us. Um, we have a number of in incredible programs going on here at the OU Israel Center. I encourage you on your way out to take a tour of Tibbetts Magazine so you'll see all the great things that are happening here. And without further ado, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Barbara Sofer, I think. Just, just before that, there's one chair that's available. And I think there's any more chairs that's there. I don't know if there are any more chairs. Are there any chairs available? There's one here. Good evening. I'm Barbara Sofer. Uh, any of you read my Jerusalem Post column? Okay, come on. Let's Okay, well, thank you. Thank you all for coming. We apologize for the difficult seating, um, but we can't say we're sorry that so many people have come. And uh, I'd like to especially like, thank you all for coming. We really do appreciate it. It's a really special moment for us. And uh, a special thanks for Ricky for organizing this in the Israel Center for immediately agreeing to host this event. I'd like to thank particularly my children and, and granddaughter who are here, and I'd like to also make special, and my husband, I'd like to make special thanks to my sister, Dr. Charlotte Gohler, who's in the audience for reading an early version of the book and commenting as a psychologist. You'll see that in the book, we, we're very much interested in, the, in psychology, and I think that you'll enjoy our speculations. Anyway, I worked on this book at the suggestion of our mutual friend, Lynn Gampel, who isn't here tonight, many of you know her, and uh, it was a long journey for us together. Now, I've heard Rena tell her story. How many in the audience have heard Rena tell her story? Right, or, so, or have, have read her story. So it seemed like a straightforward challenge. We had the outline of a very compelling story. Right, that's where we really wanted to start. But let me just tell you, writing about the Holocaust is never simple. First of all, you have to get everything right, or you start getting letters from Holocaust deniers. I know that from my column. Anytime I've written a story about the Holocaust, the world of Holocaust deniers um, is out there ready to deny whatever you're going to write. Also, 70 years after the liberation of Bergen Benson, it is a more complex challenge. Now, a study was done by the ADL about uh, two, three years ago, a worldwide study, which showed that 50% of the people in the world don't even know what the Holocaust is, let alone knowing, let's say, what Bergen Belsen is. So what was Bergen Belsen? Well, at first it was a prisoner of war camp. Then it became an exchange camp. It was certainly a concentration camp. Afterwards, it was a displaced person camp. It wasn't an extermination camp, exactly. There were six, only six of those, but some 50,000 people died there. 
You've seen the photos, the horrendous photos of the piles of dead bodies in Bergen-Belsen, but most of the people in the world have not. Rina was found still alive among those dead. It was clear to me early in the work that I couldn't just write Rina's story, that today we need to write a broader canvas. We need to be able to explain to all of those who've heard of the Holocaust and all of those who haven't that there was a Holocaust and we need to create something that will be passed on. I read my first Holocaust book in 1963. I was a little girl and um, actually was in high school already. I think it changed my life and like all of us probably in this room, we've read dozens of books about the Holocaust. But still I found when I sat down to write, there were so many questions. Rina's hometown, Pietrakov, for instance, was the first ghetto that the Germans created. There were 355 others in Poland after that. So it's a complicated subject, ghetto. And the Nazis learned how to do ghetto on the backs of families like Rina's. I was interested in Pietrakov. It wasn't a shtetl like Fiddler on the Roof, right? Nor a capital like Warsaw. I felt I needed to recreate the city with its rich Jewish life before the Nazis destroyed it. Otherwise, who cared, right? For that, I needed testimonies and I needed background. Rena was three and a half before the war. So, I had to read many, many uh, testimonies, and I had to sit in Yad Vashem. We would go to Yad Vashem, and I would sit there and listen to testimonies by people no longer here, people I couldn't question, but people who fortunately gave their testimonies decades ago in Yad Vashem, decades closer to the war, and of course, they were much older than Rina. So that's the kind of a quilt, I would say, that we had to put together for this book. And of course, there was that huge operative question about Rena herself. How could anyone go through what she went through and be Rena? All of you who know her, right? So positive, so energetic, so friendly, so warm, so American, right? <laughs> <laughs> so American, no. Writing her story, A Daughter of Many Mothers, of course, requires overcoming cognitive dissonance and trying to figure out how someone with such a horrific childhood could be a robust and healthy adult. I discover, for instance, that the research on survivors, much of it done in Israel, by the way, by Holocaust survivors themselves, people who really understood, much of the research debunked some of the early theories based on a very small group of survivors who sought psychological help after the war. Very few survivors wanted to go to psychologists after the war. And those who went often needed to get a, um, a, a note to get compensation. So it's not clear whether everything they gave in terms of their psychological health was exactly right. I, I mention this because it helps us understand Rina. Because is she typical or atypical? That's a question that you have to ask when reading this book. Her survival belies another myth that Holocaust inmates lost their humanity in the struggle to be the fittest to survive. One woman, one good Jewish woman after another reached out to Rina to share food and warmth, even at the peril of their own lives. Even temporary motherhood proved to be stronger than the fear of death. Reliable sources are rarer than you can think. 
the few fellow survivors we meet at the reunions of Petrikov survivors, almost all older than Rita, don't remember her or anyone from her large family, a large family. And despite the vaunted exactitude of the Nazi bookkeeping, records are scarce. Children weren't always listed, records were destroyed. A Polish researcher was hired for the hunt and his work was invaluable. We were disappointed by false leads and dead ends. A woman turned up from Chicago and insisted that she knew Rina from Sweden. A hostess at the Inbal looked at the picture. She told her story. The hostess had heard Rina. She knew me. She called in such excitement. What excitement? We rushed down to the Inbal. She was sure. She had a photo from Sweden that claimed Rina was that little orphan girl who a Swedish family wanted to adopt. Well, she was a little orphan girl in Sweden. Rina's always polite, you know that. We met with a person and Rina, and Rina thanked her so much. And then when we were alone, she said to me, that's not me in the picture. <laughs> well, who's right? How do we know? It would have been fabulous if we had that picture, right? So what do you do in Israel? You turn to the police and you ask the police detective the same detective, Sharon Brown, who deciphered astronaut Elon Ramon's burnt diary that came bur coming down from space. And you knock on her door and you say, I have to find out if this picture is the same as a friend of mine who's a Holocaust survivor. And in Israel, the national police says, okay, that's a worthy, that's a worthy um, a project for us. So give us some pictures. Of course, they're busy looking at pictures of terrorists, but they understand. So we submit the photos, and we hit to Detective Brown, and they want more photos, and then finally the phone call comes, and they say, that's not Rena. So on one hand, we're disappointed. It would have been great, right? Another's resource, right? But then I guess we were even happier because Rena's memory what she does remember from the whole period, turned out to be right in almost every case. Memory, we talk about a lot about that in the book. Also the day that we went to see a psychologist. I thought it was time, reading over with someone after all these years. So off we went to a psychologist, but you'll get it all in the book. If you haven't bought copies yet, we have some more. And if you haven't, um, if we haven't signed them, we'd be glad to stay and sign them. And I'll tell you, it's, it's youth friendly. So if you want the next generation and the next generation to read it and to learn about, to be among the half that know about the Holocaust, I suggest it. There was one little bit racy part, but Rena made me take it out. <laughs> She'll have to tell you what that was about. So with, with that, I'll read part of the book and then turn the podium over to me now. Okay, so. I'm ready to die. I find a spot near a tree and lie down. Men, women, and children, some like me, not yet dead, lie here too. A breeze stirs my hair. It brings the stench of the dead, a smell that I'm used to. Dying under a tree will be nicer than in the stinking barracks. All the fences are lined with bodies, piled higher than a man standing tall, not that men stand tall anymore. I'm nine years old. I've spent most of my childhood in the ghetto, a work camp, concentration camps, and a death march. bergen Belsen is the worst of all. There's no water, not even the filthy puddles of yesterday. Suddenly the quiet is broken. I hear an unfamiliar sound and look up. People are running. Men and women who never walk faster than a shuffle are running. I want to see where they're going, but I can't stand up. I'm sick. People who never talk louder than a whisper are shouting. Soldiers in khaki uniforms are walking nearby. 
I can tell they aren't German soldiers by the way the prisoners greet them with shouts of joy. How strange. Some of the soldiers are throwing up. Nazi soldiers never throw up. Instant free. You are free. You're free. Our words on the loudspeaker. We are the English army. Be calm. Food and medical help are on their way. We are free, women shout around me in Yiddish. What does free mean? I don't understand. I'm too sick and tired to move. I want my mother. Rena quit. Somebody today told me, a guide in Yad Vashem, that she reads it at the beginning, and when they get to Bergen Belsen, they don't have to know anymore. It says it all. But I also want to start off by thanking the OU, and Ricky, and Rabbi Shore. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Barbara for really writing this book and putting me on the way. Somebody asked how we got together. Lynn Gimpel, who we'd like very much to thank, is not here, but she was the Shachane. And Sarah Farkas and Heshi started me off in 1981 when I knew very, very little. Now everything that's in the book and everything that I say can be proven. Barbara found my temperature chart in 1945. Would you believe it? I said that I had typhus, and I believed that I had typhus, but everybody had typhus, so it was easy to say that. She found my temperature chart, and she had the doctors in um, Hadassah verify it. Um, I want to thank my husband for 59 years. <laughs> he was the one who encouraged me in every way and helped me write all my speeches, and now I don't have a speech because he's not helping me write them, so I just have to do it myself. I want to thank my daughters and my grandchildren who have come. They don't usually come when I when I speak, so I'm very, very pleased that they have. I'm sorry people are standing. And I want to thank our coach Marco for letting us be here. I really feel very moved, very touched, and very privileged to have an audience like yours to, to come here. When I say I'm privileged, I think I am privileged to be living in Israel. I'm privileged to be living in Yerushalayim. I'm privileged to be part of all of you old and new friends, and I'm privileged to be alive. When I read the book, and sometimes I think about the different things, it's really impossible. Somebody outside said something about a movie, but somebody who writes movies said, if a writer would write this, they would say there are too many plots and too convoluted. Lately, since writing the book, I have found that I, I associate and I connect and I relate to many things that happen all around me, things that you took for granted. One of the things that I read every week and I think about are the different Parsha that we read in the last few weeks, starting with the Parsha of Avraham. Avraham was sitting in his tent, <coughs> waiting to be hospitable, and three men came. Three men, because each one had a mission. They came to tell him one that his wife would give birth, the second one that stone would be destroyed, and the third one was Beaker Holding because he just had a writ. Who were those people? Angels. Angels. We all know that those men were angels. <laughs> then we have the story of Lot. He lived in Stone, which was a terrible city with idolatry and adultery and murder and killing and rape. Two men came, he harbored them, and then they helped him. Who were they? Angels. angels. And then last week we read about Abraham Avinu, where he went up the angels 
who he said went up the ladder and down. Yako, Yako, sorry. Yes, no one was sleeping here. Yako, what did I say? Yako, Yako, Yako. We talked about Abraham. Why did the angels first go up and then down? He was down there, and the angels came to guard him, the angels of Israel. When a man like Yaakov goes out of there, the angels go up to heaven, and they send other people to come down. I'm not comparing myself to the above, but I can't help believe that my six mothers, who were just people, were really angels that God sent. And especially, Barbara, I didn't tell you this, and I don't know if it was in the book, but my fifth mother, I'm sorry, not good? My fifth mother, whose name was Anna Phillips Stahl, and she gave me the name Fanny Phillips. Her daughter died, and she asked me if I wanted to be her daughter. I was going to go to Palestine. Why Palestine in 1945? There was no Israel. So I was going to go to Palestine with the orphans, and she was going to go. Her brother sent her tickets and affidavits and all the papers that she needed, and her daughter died. So she asked me. She gave me her daughter's name, her birthday. Anna was in the Holocaust. She suffered greatly. She came to America. She brought me to America, and she died. Now, we think that every one of the angels who came to visit, there were three of them. Why three? Because each one had a different mission. Maybe she had different missions, and one of her missions was to bring me to the United States. If she hadn't brought me here, I could have been adopted by a Swedish Christian couple and been a good Christian woman now. Or I could have been brought to Eretz Israel in 1945 under very different conditions, living on a kibbutz or an off, and I certainly would not have been Barina with the name that I have now. Now, Barbara sort of said, we have to introduce ourselves, who we are. I think many of you know who I am. Who I am. But when I think of who am I, do you remember the movie The Queen, The King of Siam? and I'm the King of Siam? Tis a puzzlement. Remember that expression, tis a puzzlement? That's what I think about me. Tis a puzzlement. How do you know who you are if you've had six different mothers by the age of 10? If you had six different names? If you were a boy, a girl, a boy, without the modern operations of today. <laughs> if you were born in two different countries, I tell you I was born in Poland, and now my passport says I was born in Germany. I was born on two different times. I was born in December of 35. I was born in February of 36. How do you know? But I do know who I am. I know that I'm a wife to a wonderful man. I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a great-grandmother. I'm an Israeli-American Jewish religious woman who believes very firmly in God, in the state of Israel, and who we are today. And I, um, when we talk about remembering, we'll talk about that maybe later on. But as Barbara asked me questions, and she went over and over asking questions, for a while, I just didn't know. After a while, things started coming back, and then we proved, I don't know if we get a chance to tell you, but we found this man, Yatsik, who helped us. You won't believe this. In 1930, my biological mother had a prenuptial agreement. <laughs> a prenuptial agreement, and apparently she was a wealthy woman. My father either didn't have money or he didn't want to divulge the money, which very often happens to things like that. We found that. We found the temperature chart that we have. As I said, Barbara found 144 relatives that I knew nothing about them. One of them, Sandy Kozlowski, was here. Uh, her mother-in-law, Lily Kozlowski, when I met her in 1980s, and I tried to talk to her, I thought she would help me remember certain things. She cried. Every time I spoke to her, she cried bitterly. And there was no way, and I would just change the subject. And where is Sandy? She, they, she said I'm the here on thing. the floor. <laughs> on, the, on the floor. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, uh, Barbara wanted me to tell you the first part, and she won't read it from the book, what I said. 
I was born in Pietrica. You might know the name Pietrica because our current rabbi is the grandson, Rabbi David Lau, is the grandson of the man who was a rabbi in our shul. And then his son, Israel Meir Lau, was the chief rabbi, and now, as I said, his grandson. Before that, by the way, another thing that we found, and I don't think Bob is going to talk about this, but it's all in the book, the man who married my biological parents were by Meir Shapiro, the one who started Dafyomi and the one who started Chachmei uh, Lublin. And the reason Rabbi Lau came is because he left to go there. So we have the signature, and my brother-in-law, my son-in-law, was very excited that we had the signature of Rabbi uh, Meir Shapiro. Pietrakov, as Barbara said, was the first ghetto that was organized. It was in the middle of Poland, halfway between Krakow and Warsaw. When the Germans came in in September of 39, there was bombing, tanks came in, there was a lot of noise and a lot of excitement and a lot of dead people and people running away, people not knowing what was going on. And the ghetto was established. They fenced in with barbed wire all the different places. I don't remember being hungry, maybe because my mother was able to afford things, so maybe because I just don't remember that. I remember a few pleasant things uh, going on to a, to, on a, with a child on a Shabbos. You'll read all about that in the book, but I don't remember that much. But early on in the ghetto, when the Nazis came in, if a man was lucky enough to get a job to work, it meant maybe his life would be saved. Because if he was needed, then maybe they wouldn't kill him, because they were going to use a slave labor. So my father and other able-bodied men were taken off. I remained in the house with my mother and my two brothers, Yassi and David. One night, in the middle of the night, toward early in the morning, there was banging going down, and the Nazis and their helpers came in yelling, everybody, schnell, schnell, you've got a short time to get everything together and run down the steps. And I have a picture of those steps. Didn't bring the pictures tonight, but many of the things are in the book, or someday we'll show it again. Uh, there was chaos, there was confusion, there was pandemonium. Until we got into a big square, 2,000 people had been gathered together. And then from that square, and by the way, one of the other things we found, which is amazing, that my grandparents owned an apartment right on the corner of that square. So when you think about six million, it's hard to imagine. But when Shoba shows you that apartment belonged to your grandparents, it makes it very personal and touching. In that square, they were beating us like animals, like herds of animals being chased until we got to Rabbi Lau's synagogue. 2,000 people couldn't get into the synagogue. There was a little house like a base medrash next to that. And we have a picture of the, of the, of the, of the Aaron Kodesh with the Ten Commandments with bullet holes in it. They were shooting, they were beating, there was people being bopped over their heads. I don't know how this possibly could have happened. I know it happened. I know that 2,000 people could not get into the room, so some went into the other room, and the ones who couldn't were taken out into the forest, which Barbara and I attended when we went on a Hadassah mission, and they had to dig their own graves, and they were shot into those graves. I'm sure that I was holding, what do you think a little girl, I was about six, six and a half at that time, does when there's such fear, when there's such shooting, there's such chaos going on? I think I must have been holding on tightly to my mother. I think she must have been holding on tightly to me and to my brother. And I hope she's looking down. I'm sure she's up there in heaven. Looking down, look at this crowd of people who are in Israel, who have come to hear the story, who remember will not forget the Holocaust. And I hope that Hitler is looking up to also see it. <laughs> that we are here. He didn't think there would be a man, woman, or child around. We're here. Barbara, would you read the story? Would you read the part about my being with my mother and holding on to her hand?
one that is very well marked. Uh, it's on page 100. Page 100? Yes. Okay. Use this very often. There's a man with a club, a gun, and a snarling dog that looks at our ankles. He searches my mother and takes a wedding ring. He marches us to a field and then into the great synagogue, now reduced to a prison. In front of me, a soldier hits a woman holding the baby with his gun. She falls, still holding the baby. Lying in the road are two other women not moving. Outside the synagogue, the Germans have brought horses and wagons. The synagogue is surrounded by Ukrainian workers. We are locked in the synagogue. Those who try to escape are shot. A few people manage to get out because they are tradesmen and or are employed in certain factories like Papa. I don't know how they got there in the first place. Certain Jews are also ransomed by their family. Thus, for example, parents gave themselves up in order to save their children. Many men, women, children are led from the synagogue. People are running and screaming. Babies are crying. I remember the fear and the confusion. I remember the commotion. I hear someone calling my name. Come, Fredja, he says. Come, Fredja, a command. He motions frantically for me to come, Fredja, and I'm holding my mother's hand. The German guards can shoot me, hit me over the head, and push me back. For some reason, they don't. Maybe they think that the next soldier who sees me will kill me. Perhaps a guard is bribed and leaves the door open. Maybe my parents believe that boys have a better chance of surviving than a little girl and have set up my escape. Maybe I have the resourcefulness and guts to respond to a call that will save my life and run on my own. The circumstances are cloudy, but what happened next is clear. I let go of my mother's hand. I don't look back. I'm running. This man scoops me up in his arms and we run for shelter. The heavy synagogue doors close behind me. I remember escaping. I can still remember letting go of my mother's hand and her letting go of my hand. I'm six and a half years old. My mother's hand, my mother's hand, my mother's hand. How does a little girl let go of her mother's hand? My mother opens her clutched fingers. She lets me go. She saves my life. How does a little girl run away from her mother and her brothers when she's so scared. I never see my mother or brothers again. How does a little girl recover from such a loss? tell you too much because she wants you to buy the book, but I think most of you have already bought the book. Yeah. So you're I hope you're feeling guilty if you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want you to know that the first printing has been completely sold out. I mean, in, in a month's time, we managed. We have, we have somebody from Yad Vashem, and he's part of the Christian desk, and the Christians are great about buying the book. And, and they also gave me a ring, a gold and silver ring, which I wear only when I speak to them, because thank God I have my own ring. But they want to be part of the Holocaust and to explain how sorry they are. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you that a few years ago, I spoke to a Christian group in the Feast of Tabernacles. And um, it was an amazing introduction. I was supposed to speak for seven, eight minutes. I'm going away from the book, but I have to tell you this because it was very interesting. And um, I prepared for seven or eight minutes, which is very long time. In the other show, we get an hour. And I'm sitting in the audience with my husband and with Renee Ginsburg. Some of you may know her. 
and ready to go up there. There were about 4,000 pilgrims who had come for the Feast of Tabernacles in that square where you have the ceremony for the, the, uh, on, on Yom HaShoah. And as I'm sitting there, all of a sudden, this man gets up and he says, We have quit. We have come to apologize to you. Who is this man? How does he know who I'm here? But he is late. He's the ambassador from Germany wow. and part of the Christian group. And he said, We have come to apologize for not doing enough, not doing more than we have. And then as he goes on, they're wearing these beautiful pageants and they say to me, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Eloheinu, Hashem Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then the next man gets up, and it was the ambassador from Switzerland, Serena Quint, we have come to tell you how sorry we are that we did not do. And I said, what am I supposed to say when I get up there? When I get up there, I said, I was absolutely, you know, I couldn't speak. And I said, the people who we had to apologize to, unfortunately, when I did, they were killed. Six million Jews and a million and a half children had perished. But when I think about it, if we had friends like you, the Christian people, in the late 1930s and 40s, maybe things would have been different for the victims or even the survivors. And if only, if only the nations of the world had opened their doors to us, but nobody did, things would have been different. And if only, if only, if only we had a state of Israel. But we didn't. And thank God we have the state of Israel. We have a lot of enemies, but we also have a lot of friends, and we have each other. And we have a government, whether you approve of everything or not. We have a government, and we have an army, and we can help ourselves. My mother and brothers were taken to Treblinka with the rest of the people. 860,000 people were killed in Treblinka. And now they're just stones there. And maybe later on I'll tell you how I found the stone of Pietrica after being with Rabbi Lau. This man took me to my father. What was my father supposed to do with me? He dressed me as a boy. He told me I was 10 years old and I worked with the men. How I did it, I don't know. But we worked without getting you all the details until there was another action. And again, when the Germans realized that the Allies, the Americans and the British and the Russians were getting closer, they wanted to hide everything they had done. So even the extermination camps, the six that were in Poland, were sending people out. Even like Anne Frank was sent, she eventually got to Bergen Belsen and died there. And um, so we were being chased, sent out again. And again, we were chased into the tank of cars with nothing to eat and nothing to drink and a toilet for 80, 100 people. It was terrible. And finally, we got out there and we jumped into the snow. It was always snowing and cold, the way I remember it. And um, uh, German soldiers on motorcycles with sidecars came running up and, and, and they made an announcements saying, we're going to be taken to camps, men on one side, women on the other. You know, and apparently my father knew, I didn't, didn't know anything, that when you get into a camp, you have to get undressed. Why? First of all, because we smelled and we were sick and we were filled with lice. But another reason, if you have a ring or a necklace or anything like that, they can confiscate if you're naked. So he knew that you got, if I would get undressed, they would see I'm not going to let kill me. He met a school teacher. He gave me some pictures. He asked her to keep an eye on me. He promised to meet me after the war in Pietrica. Didn't keep that promise. I went with my new teacher. I don't even remember her name. Uh, a lot of description of how we walked in the snow, how we got to Bergen Belsen, how she saved my life by stealing the coat just to keep us warm because we slept on the stone floor and then she disappeared and somebody else became my father. My father promised to meet me. He was sent to Buchenwald. We have the train schedule, another thing that we found, with the two our brothers on the same one. And um, uh, in Bergen-Belsen, as Barbara read, 
There were 10,000 bodies left just lying around when the British came in. And I found myself under a tree, and as she wrote so very poignantly, it was better being outside even in the cold than being in that stinking, terrible <coughs> barracks with lice and fleas and, and, and rats eating at you with everybody being sick. And all of a sudden we were liberated. After we were liberated, because I was working for the lucky ones, the first thing they had to do was bury all the bodies and take care of things. Because I was one of the lucky ones, 6,000 refugees were invited to come to recuperate in Sweden. And I had the muscle of being one. In Sweden, I met a new mother. First of all, I was in the Swedish hospital where a Christian couple went to the doctor. I would have loved it. I really wanted to go with them. But everybody said that I was Jewish. I didn't know what that meant. And I should go with the Jewish children to Palestine. I went to a second DP camp, and I met another mother. Her name was Anna. She's the one who brought me to America. But shortly after we got here, everything was fine. I was learning English. I went to, we went up to the Catskill Mountains. Remember the uh, kachalens that people had where you just cook for yourself. And there was a bathroom on one side and a kitchen on one side. I went to camp. I learned to swim. I learned to play hide and seek. But one day, Anna disappeared. And they took us to the grave. Could you read about the grave? No. no. So I'll just tell you about that. I didn't know exactly what she was going to read, but it was the first time I ever saw anybody being buried. Nobody explained to me. They thought I was so smart. Everybody was crying except for me. And Birkin Bells and 10,000 bodies were running around. Nobody cried. You just put out another body and you just went with it. You didn't smell them because it was there all the time. One person died and everybody was wailing and everybody was crying. And then we went to South And the problem now occurred. My name at that time was Fanny or Francis. My name started off as Fredja. It was uh, Fregel. When I was a boy, it was Freuden. And I became Fanny. Then I became Francis. Francis was Joy. Joy is Rina. That's how I got my name, Rina, from my adopted parents, the Globes, that many of you um, may know. And um, we were sitting Shiva. And they had a problem. They brought over a mother who was going to take care of her child. She also had a son, Sigmund. But now that she wasn't there, they really didn't want me. Or it sounded a very nice way of saying they want me, but they, I had to be fed, and I had to be clothed, and I had to be schooled and taken care of. There was somebody in their home who knew somebody else in Brooklyn, New York, and there was a lot of discussion. And I was invited there for Shabbat. When I got there, Chicken soup was on the stove, it was a Friday, everything was fine, except that they had a little dog, Buddy Hakelev. <coughs> I didn't like dogs. There were dogs in, in Germany that always just bit you and then went after you. They told me that he would be okay and he became my best friend after a while. But they gave me a bed and they gave me warmth. And when it was time to go home after Shabbat, they asked me the same question that other people had asked me before, and I'd like to stay and be their daughter. Well, I very much want to be their daughter, otherwise I'd be sent to an orphanage. And I behaved and I acted very nicely and very politely, because if I wouldn't be polite and if they wouldn't want me, they would send me someplace to an orphanage and I don't know where that place was. So I became their daughter. And starting at the age of 10, I became an American princess, an American Jewish princess. There was a Jewish Zionistic beautiful, wonderful people. Many of you remember Leah Glow. How many of you remember Leah Glow? Yeah, she, yeah, she, my father, Jacob Glow, died in 1972, but she lived to, she was 103 quarters. And um, she gave me a very good life. But somebody pointed out just the way she took care of me. When she got older, she had a family, where she had a daughter and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And she loved them very much, and they loved her. And Bob was going to read to you a section of how I felt when I first started. I think I'm 10 years old. I'm climbing the monkey bars at recess. 
Rita's climbing higher up. She's the prettiest girl in my class. Her long blonde hair is swinging in the sunlight, <coughs> making a golden arc as she reaches upward with strong arms. She's smiling and confident. She laughs aloud. She doesn't seem to have a care in the world. Oh, so that's how you're supposed to do it, I say to myself. I'm athletic too and can climb the bars and hang upside down. I have soft blonde hair, clean and shiny too. But I'm missing Rita's jauntiness. There is something unquantifiable about her embrace of childhood that I know nothing about. That's what I want. If I can't have it, I must at least act as if I do. I get it now. You're supposed to be, to just be able to play without worrying about what comes next, or at least to pretend. You're not supposed to come to show that you're trying hard to survive and that you become an expert at not dying. I can do this, I tell myself. No one is going to see that I'm never relaxed. If I know how I'm supposed to feel and act as if it's that way, I do feel it might help. I've already gotten in trouble for my hyper alertness. One, uh, once upon a time, I lived in a lovely home in Poland. There I had a loving mother and father and two beloved brothers. The beds had crisp white embroidered sheets and my mother tucked me in with a soft down quilt. Our table was set with real china there were flowers on the table. We bought ice cream cones from the kiosk across the street. I had my, sl I had my own sled. Now all that's gone. But that mother and father and my brothers are all dead. Only I survive. Now like Rita, again I live in a lovely home in Brooklyn. But how different are our dreams and nightmares Girls like Rita have no idea of the scale of my losses. How could they? And that's how I want it. In America, elementary school girls use the word cooties. They don't really have cooties. Everyone's so clean. I lived for years with lice crawling all over my body. If you didn't kill them, your skin turned black, and then you died. Who would want to climb the monkey bars with a girl who went years <coughs> without taking a real bath? Who will want to play dolls with a girl who was pulled out from among thousands of dead bodies to be brought back to life? Who will want to swap <coughs> stories with a girl whose mothers always died? Each time I lost a mother, I had to absorb the loss. There was no time to be sad and cry. I had to remain alert if I was about to survive. I couldn't have red eyes and a swollen nose from crying if I wanted the next mother to love me. Without a mother, I wouldn't survive. How long will I have Leia glow? She hugs me and tells me forever. But in some matters, I may be wiser than my new mother. She still has her original mother-in-law, who says she's now my grandmother. But for me, life isn't like that. Just imagine what it means to remember such things while you're climbing the monkey bars with carefree, carefree classmates. I might think of my mother loosening her grip on my hand and, without thinking, loosen my own grip. A flash of memory might make me fall. I never want to fall. It's safer to forget. So, if you have any questions, or we'll be glad to take them. And then that's it for the evening. The rest. 
really is really all there in the book, and we're glad that we have it. <laughs> talk about it. After the Eichmann trial, they realized how important, and they were also living. Uh, Moshe Dayan just was very angry with the survivors. He felt, if you're going to be taken, why are you going to walk like sheep to slaughter? Why don't you fight them? Until there was a, um, a terrorist thing in Malot. And um, there were, do you remember that? You yes. shake your head. So there were um, three terrorists. There were 125 students, there were 10 teachers, there was a principal, and they called the army. And Diane came, and he saw how helpless he was. Because if he would try to sell them, they would blow up the whole building. And then he realized how helpless the Jews were with all the guns going around there. But Barbara started asking me questions. I started thinking of a lot of things. There are certain things that you never forget. You never forget the cold. Seems to me that it never was warm in Poland. I've been back many times to Poland in the spring and the summer, and there's sunshine. When Barbara took me on Hadassah, we came in, and she said, how do you feel about being here? And she wrote an article. I said, there are two of me. There's Fredja, the little girl who was scared and cold, and always thinking of, of the fear that's going around her. And there's Rena Quint of Jerusalem, was here on, and staying in a fancy hotel. As a matter of fact, it was very fan, funny because we stayed in this very fancy hotel and I came in and this man took me up to my room and I said, is it okay to drink the water? Oh, and I said to myself, for three days at the end of Bergen-Belsen, there was no water because the, the Germans claimed that the Allies bombed the, the water pipes. When the British came in, they were able to fix it. And there was no food. And then they found all these uh, packages from uh, Hungarian things. So when she started asking me things, I started thinking. I had a frozen toe from walking in the snow. You, you don't forget that. You never forget smells. The smell of the soup of Bergen Belsen. When you walk in the back of a restaurant and they throw out the garbage. When you, you smell a dead animal. Can you imagine what it's like to smell 10,000 bodies? You just, it, it gets to be part of you. And when you think about it afterwards, those things come back. And on the other hand, one of the things that I tried very hard, Barbara took me to the psychologist, and she was very nice, and she finished off saying, you remember enough, and what you don't remember, you're lucky you don't remember. And people ask me if I go through hypnosis, and I don't want to because I really don't want to learn the things that I don't want to. But what I miss so much is seeing what, what did my mother look like? Um, we found the Yatsik, the man who found, found a picture of my father, and when I got it, and it's in the book, I said, that's not my father, it doesn't look like him. Then he sent me the whole, it was his um, two dots of like identity, and it really was. But I don't remember him at all. I don't remember my brothers, what their faces looked like. Things like that you really miss them. Does anybody in my family look like anybody from my... I had some pictures and they tore them up and threw them away. You read about that in the book. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. Uh, as, a, as a little child, uh, what gave you the, the force to go on living? Because I think God did. You must have been desperate. You know what? I don't think I knew that there was a different kind of life. 
This is the only thing that I knew that I existed. When the Ethiopians came here, I went to help them, and they were wearing shoes made out of tires, and they didn't know how to brush their teeth, or they didn't know how to flush a toilet or things like that. They didn't know these things. They weren't on anything that's part of them. I didn't know there was a different life. I had a different life till I was maybe three and a half, or maybe even the ghetto, there was some semblance. But everything that happened to me, it just happened. I don't think I had a choice of doing things. Luckily, I always had a woman, somebody, who took care of me. I took care of me. How much could they take care of you? They didn't have enough food, they didn't have any clothing, but the fact that there was somebody near you meant an awful lot. When you read the news now, do you think that Jews in Israel and in the diaspora are doing enough to counter what seems to be an increased wave of anti-Semitism? I don't know what enough is. There's never any enough. But I think the fact that we have a state that we can fight for ourselves. We're finding a BDS right now. We're outnumbered, is for sure. So it's not easy to do, but whatever we do is more. And, and, and thank God we've got governments who are willing to go along with us. But they'll never be enough. And why should there still be anti-Semitism? But there is, unfortunately. Ah. Were there other children around you? Yes. There was a house in Bergen-Belsen, and there's a book about the house in Bergen-Belsen. But Barbara describes that she did a tremendous amount of research that I did. Bergen-Belsen was divided into many camps. And there was the horror camp where women from Poland and gypsies who lived and there were children there. I lived in a house with children, but on the other side, there were women with children, like mothers, and I saw a woman giving birth. I don't know what happened to the baby. I heard the woman screaming. I heard the woman um, cursing. There was a baby crying. And the next day, the baby was gone. And, you know, everybody talked about it. It was not anything like that. But there were some children. They were hoping at one point, as Barbara said, it was an exchange camp. They were hoping they were going to get children, trucks for children, or they get prisoners of war, things like that. It never happened. Thank you all very much.